this is quite important as far as I'm concerned because um, I think at a lot of these conferences you don't actually hear the operators speaking. It's often the finance guys. And in my job, I, I represent, that's why you'll see you don't have a tie. I'm not wearing the banker's uniform this afternoon. Um, we, we, there's such a, a chasm between the operators, the project sponsors, the contractors, the consultants, and then the finance people, be they DFIs, be they banks, uh, fund managers, whatever they may be. There's such a, a chasm between them. And that is why, um, you know, I often say to people, banks don't build roads. Who's going to build the road? It's not going to be a bank. So how come the operators and the construction companies and the consulting engineers and so on are not in this room? Because most of the people in this room are, uh, are finance people. And that's, that, that, to me, I don't understand it, unless I'm from outer space or something. I don't understand why that is. Now, just to, as, as the, the date chair intimated, uh, there are a couple of very important changes happening. And um, in regard to this and why it's so necessary for you to listen to the operators, what we're going to hear, we're very lucky, we're going to hear a whole lot of project pitches from people, uh, with the exception of SADIC, because I think we'll start with SADIC and get SADIC just to sketch the scene first. And then after that... Um, We'll hear the, the project pitches or business pitches, uh, one after the other. And uh, everybody's pretty short of time, so I've told them four or five minutes max. And, um, and I think we, in any case, it's always better if you've got a good idea to be punchy and quick. But just uh, some of the things. There, there are, there's more operator finance happening now. For example, Bolloray, the SDB Bolloray investing in ports. So that's changing things. But a very important thing that's happening now is, is unsolicited bids. There are more and more unsolicited bids, which the donors in that traditionally don't like. But there are more and more people basically getting together with all the components required, finance, construction, logistics, very, very important. You always need a logistics player in these projects. In fact, we can't talk projects without finance and logistics, those two things. Um, and they band together. And so you get people on the project food chain, starting from the supplier to the contractor to the consultant to the pre-feasibility guys. This, this conference, I want to suggest it to Hubert, to do a conference just of the pre-feasibility guys, the guys doing project management, the guys doing GIS, the guys doing environment impact assessments, which is very early in the project food chain. So everybody shooting from the... Remember that you... There are no suppliers in this room that I met, but maybe there are some. The suppliers, the manufacturers, must realize that the, the specifications for inclusion of their product in a project are not written at supply phase. They're written at pre-feasibility, feasibility phase. So why are they standing at the back of the queue? They should shoot up the line. And overarching everything is legal, finance, and logistics. Everybody's concerned with those three things, no matter where you are in the food chain. So I'm trying very hard within Africa House. We, we've got 170 clients we service, and I provide greenfields and brownfields projects to our clients. Um, also, I'd like to say, I was talking to Hubert before, um, this morning, and we were saying that from what happened yesterday, I wasn't here yesterday, but that the role players, the number of role pay players in the development finance world now have multiplied considerably. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, it was Daddy World Bank and it was tenders and it was pretty boring. Today, you've got, uh, as you heard, a proliferation of equity funds. You've got sovereign wealth funds. You've got all kinds of machinations and new, new acrobatics we're performing to try and make sure that these projects happen. Because Africa is very strange in that we have plenty of projects, and I live, eat, sleep projects all day long. I travel in Africa all the time. I speak some of the languages. I'm, I'm quite used to it. And, and I go onto project sites. And I see projects. I see good projects. And we've heard today plenty of times that there's money. Look at all those pension funds. I mean, that was amazing, that one talk on the, the billions that are lying around. So we don't have a problem with money. We don't have a problem with projects. We, the, 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 it falls down in the middle. That's where the problem lies, and that's, that's basically what we've been talking about all morning, really, once you, once you really um, analyze it. So, um, as I say, my parting message before we start with the, with the actual uh, pitches from the project pitches, uh, as we'll go to SADIC next, but um, as I say, I say to my clients constantly, hunt in packs, hunt in packs. Get the different elements together and move in packs. Even if you're not talking about unsolicited bids, it's still necessary to do that because of that project food chain mechanism that I was telling you about. I'm a very unacademic, very direct, because that's the way I'm working with hard engineers. No time for fancy dissertations and all of that. They, they just want to know where, what, who, how much, when, how, as quickly as possible. And therefore, we have to cater for that. So I'm coming from a di very different mindset. And we have to really, really um, uh, bear that in mind that... Um, 
that, that we have to have to collaborate. Cross-border, uh, if, if you need a, a, a particular skill from Turkey, then you go and fetch a Turkish partner, whatever, like we're in business, we're not flying flags here. So um, obviously you get certain benefits if you keep it within the, na the nation. Right, um, we've got about five minutes left, so um, I'm going to ask you please to, um, I've, I've got a lot of questions and we could ask everybody, but I think it's much more important that you guys have been sitting here it's much more important that you ask the questions or make the comments. So please, the way it works is say who you are and where you're from quite clearly, um, please, because sometimes we can't hear when you say that. And then the other thing is uh, you, you're welcome to make a comment. You don't have to ask a question. If you know something about something of the projects, you're welcome to, to, to say something. I would love to have spoken about the coal in Botswana and a whole lot of questions, the definition of REs and got a whole lot of questions here, but there's no time, unfortunately. So uh, let's just see who's the first person. Please, uh, as you say, you can make a comment or ask a question. Just say who you are and where you're from. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Ravi from uh, Pembani Remgro Infrastructure Fund. Uh, the, question, the question is to the gentleman from Black Rhino. Uh, I think you guys are doing a great uh, project there. There's no doubt it's going to add value to the economy. What I was interested in to know is um, you're replacing the tracks. Is there resistance? from the logistics entities out there? Yeah, there has been some, and there's been, we've had discussions with the, uh, the Ministry of Transport in, in Ethiopia about that. But as the Ethiopian economy go grows, uh, well, first let me say, those fuel trucks will be on shorter runs within Ethiopia because there will be a central distri distribution place in Awash. It's basically about 125 kilometers southeast of Addis which is the terminus of the pipeline. So the trucks will be used internally for distribution of fuel. Uh, and, and we think as, a, as the, uh, we're pretty sure, as their, their demand for fuel grows, you know, th there's only 600 petrol stations in Ethiopia, I think, altogether right now. And that will grow for a, for a country of 95 million. That's not quite a bit. So there will be some, some growth in that shorter haul trucking. There can be some repurposing of those trucks as well. Uh, as you know, there's a rail project, or as you may know, there's a rail project uh, in, in, from Ethiopia to the port of Djibouti that, uh, that will require quite a bit of truck haulage and, and uh, uh, to the railhead for that. And so there will be other opportunities. But short answer is yes, we've, we've started to come across that recently. But we're yeah, working. Just to add, um, over the time with the Addis uh, Djibouti rail line, Chemin de Fer, there was uh, quite a lot of talk about the trucking lobby being so powerful and not being so keen. This was a good question because not being so keen on the project. Um, but I think, uh, I think you've answered it in the sense that if you look at Addis now, and I was there, I've been there a lot, uh, it's, it's, Addis is one big construction site. It's incredible. I, I haven't seen a city like that. You know, yes, all the other cities, Maputo is also going mad. But uh, all urban developments, we can talk about in the next panel discussion. But uh, that, that's a very good question because that is a reality that there were certain interests, no, no doubt about it. Sorry, the lady here. Yes, please Thank go. Thank you. Uh, Helen Tarnoy, Aldrich International. My question's for Mr. McCombie, and I'll try not to be too controversial. Uh, in 1998, I was the project director for AES on the Song Gas, gas to electricity project. And one of the many things that was levied against the project was that it would become a stranded asset because the Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya interconnector would be built and it would make it redundant. So that interconnector, that was 18 years ago by my reckoning, is still not built. What makes you think that you're going to be able to kickstart these very important regional interconnector projects now when they've been stalled for so long? Thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, this will be the last question or comment because we are past time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to say that uh, I think we've had a number of projects that have been dormant for a very long time uh, on account of uh, either lack of interest by the project owners, sometimes their member states, or because uh, uh, there is not yet a crisis that is looming around the primary objectives of the project. But as a strategy, uh, we undertake what you call political engineering around a number of projects. We do so quite largely in the DRC. Uh, but what we do in this process is basically to ensure that we engage the member states concerned uh, to ensure that they take ownership of the projects. 
Uh, as SADAC Secretariat, we've been working very closely with COMESA uh, in the East African community uh, to try and ensure that the three governments, basically Zambia, uh, Tanzania, and Kenya, commit themselves to these projects. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, we did establish, there is a vehicle that was established to ensure that this project is implemented. Uh, the executive secretaries and the secretary generals of these organizations are currently in constant liaison with the heads of state to ensure that uh, there are no obstacles that stand in the way of those specific projects. So based on that, uh, we have had uh, some very positive feedback uh, continuously from the member states concerned uh, and the utilities that are also in place uh, to ensure that these projects uh, would in fact uh, move at the end of the day. Uh, and we actually deliberately working with EAC uh, enlarge the project from beyond uh, Z Zambia, Tanzania to Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya to ensure that the collaboration between East African Power Pool and Southern Africa Power Pool would actually be enhanced and also that uh, uh, this would indeed enhance uh, uh, even the utilization of the interconnectors because power trading is generating a lot of money for the Southern Africa Power Pool. So I think with that model so far and particularly power trading, we are confident that the viability and indeed even the funding would not be a problem. But I think this is really the position as we see it. We are very, very confident that the project will move, sometimes slowly, but it's in a positive direction. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just, uh, I mentioned earlier on the power pools. You know, um, it's a great pity that uh, Lawrence Mashaba from the Southern Africa Power Pool passed away recently. Um, it's very sad. Uh, he was very helpful. Um, they not, can't always crack the whip and so on. And we, 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 you're bringing up the debate of the regional versus national interests thing. Um, and we were talking about it with two pipelines and all that sort of thing earlier today. And that is, uh, is a re real issue like Mtwara and uh, Pemba Palma, where the gas is, with two separate operations. You were bringing that up a lot. Um, yeah, it is, it, it's really a matter of debate. I mean, it, it, of, of, it, of discussion, shall I say. It, it, it is an important issue. Um, the other thing is that I think uh, the amount of interconnectivity projects that are going on within East African power pool. I think East Africa in many ways is leading the way in our continent, I honestly do, because I can see it from my project database. The, the project flow from East Africa is, is substantial. I'm not saying things aren't happening in the rest of Africa, but they're substantial. The, uh, our lady chair, and who am I, honestly, to, uh, she would like to ans ask a question and then we will close, yeah, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I can't resist, okay. Um, we have a, a huge challenge, of course, not only with the national, but especially with the regional projects. And to me, there was a lack of clarity on the uh, pitches here to what degree the ownership of the project is private sector and whether there's any government participation. Because when we talk about unlocking the private sector, it's, just, it's not just capital, it's expertise. It's, it's activating the, the self-interest to be able to match that with the social good. So I just wonder what people's candid views are. First of all, what is the ownership of your, your respective entities? And we often talk about local buy-in as being very important and a form of risk mitigation, right? Local pension funds, et cetera. So, you know, just quickly, what do you guys think and would our regional projects go faster if we had a more open view of ownership structure combined with the treaties or some kind of, you mentioned, um, for example, there's MOUs or agreements. What's the right, or what's the range of options here to get speed on these projects? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Tom was the one who, I think, brought in a lot of, uh, but you'd like to venture to answer to that? Sure, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, um, <coughs> Madam Chair. Um, we agree with you entirely. Um, currently we have uh, a community participation. Uh, we hesitate to call it a free carry because it's not a free carry. They're providing land um, and inviting in us into their area. Um, and in our equity mix, uh, we're intending to, well, we have invited uh, Zesco, which is the, uh, the state utility, <coughs> as a small portion, uh, NAPSA, which is the, uh, the National Pension Fund, um, for the very reasons that you mentioned, because we think it's very important to have uh, local ownership. We are, we are Zambians, we're not an international development team, we are, we're a local Zambian development team. Uh, so currently 93% um, of the equity is owned by Zambian developers. 
through. Anybody else like to, just in, so for the sake of time, just keep it uh, very brief. So, so thanks. Um, yeah, we work, uh, we always try to finance locally to the extent possible. Uh, international players will always ask, well, what about Zambia and this and that? And, you know, the Zambian pension funds, they, uh, they take Zambia risk 24 hours a day. Um, so so they, don't, they don't mind. Answering your other question uh, about how do we build up the capacity within the, the, the players, I think people focus so much on, on the horses and very few people focus on the, on the jockeys. Um, and I think if you, I mean, a lot of <coughs> developers come out of other developers. And so actually providing some, some capital uh, to the developers, uh, some working capital, so they can hire a team, train those guys up, and, and, and I think that's the way a lot of uh, other developers will, will spin out, spin out of, and, and especially uh, local-based guys. Right, anybody else want to comment? Okay. Um, the Africa Speed Rail Project, the West, uh, West Africa High Speed Rail Project is, um, as you already know, is a public-private partnership project and uh, with clear, uh, definitions on the role of the public sector uh, from the private sector. The private sector would be responsible for 100% finance raising. Uh, that also influenced the ownership of uh, the project. The government is only taking about 5% uh, ownership of the project and holding another 5% for communities um, uh, in the project. And um, the, the bulk of the ownership of the project then falls on the providers of capital and uh, a portion of it to Africa Speed Rail. Thank you. Um, you um, I think for, for us, uh, we're, we are a majority locally owned company. And um, yeah, I did mention we've got uh, local pension funds as shareholders, et cetera. What, what I think is important in Botswana is that it's such a sparsely populated country that a lot of times there's no one living in the project area, so you have to find a different way to, to contribute. So what, what we do do is uh, um, we have left 10% of the, 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 the company for, for local um, employees, et cetera. And that, that's our way of, uh, of giving back. Um, in terms of uh, government ownership, uh, my personal view is that it's better for government to be a facilitator rather than um, sitting on, on the board of the company because government processes and decisions tend to take a lot longer than what we can do as a private sector. And then the government will get its piece of the cake uh, from taxes and royalties, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, We've now done the 10 extra minutes I was given, so uh, thank you very much. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the day chair for facilitating and so on, and I'd also like to thank Africa Investor for this opportunity, and I'd especially like to thank the speakers for really speak sticking to time and really giving it short, sharp, and to the point, which I think is uh, really nice. And uh, to me, this is, for me anyway, the, the, uh, a particularly good panel because we got really good information good intelligence rather than information. So thank you very much. Give them a round of applause, please. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.